As a member of the 2020 GLI Class of Los Angeles, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker, Mayor Eric Garcetti. Eric Garcetti is a fourth generation Angelino and the 42nd Mayor of Los Angeles. As the son of public servants and the grandson and great grandson of Mexican and Eastern European Jewish immigrants, Mayor Garcetti's life has been shaped by a deep commitment to the core values of justice, dignity, and equality for all. He was first elected mayor in 2013 and again in 2017 by the largest margin in the history of Los Angeles. Beyond his time at City Hall, Mayor Garcetti has served his country as an intelligence officer in the United States Navy Reserve and is taught at the University of Southern California in Occidental College. The mayor received his BA and MA from Columbia University and studied as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University and later at the London School of Economics. He and his wife are the proud parents of a daughter and have been foster parents for over a decade. I am proud as a citizen of Los Angeles to have Mayor Garcetti at the helm of our city and I, and I am happy to welcome him to NLS. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brianna. Thank you for the kind words and introduction. And I'm so impressed by what all of the Glass Leadership Fellows are doing. A thank you as a fellow angel in this city of angels for all that you do and for the kind introduction. And welcome to everybody. What an honor it is to be with you at such a painful moment. And we need the ADL more than ever at this moment in our countries and certainly my city's history. And I wanna thank Jonathan Greenblatt, a long time Angelino himself um, for inviting me to be with you. And I'm so honored to be with so many friends with an organization I and my family have had a relationship with our entire lives. To take on this moment at our National Leadership Summit and to say, who are we as Americans? Who are we as Jews? And who are we as human beings at a moment that we are called to, not one that we want, but one that we have, and one that we must not let pass us by. We either meet this moment or we miss this moment. But let me rewind the clock to a century ago, um, to when my first native born grandparent, Harry Roth was born here in 1913. His parents had immigrated to America just seven years earlier. But that same year, in a season of so much fear and anxiety for Jews that had fled a pogrom uh, in their villages, persecution, death, and other things at the hand of an official state, we came to America to look for opportunity. And an attorney in Chicago had an idea. With two small desks and $200, he set out on a project that would span generations to ensure that no Jew would ever have to live in fear. And I want us as Jews for a moment to rewind to that moment, because to think about our ancestors and to think about the next generation right after World War II, to live through the death at the hands of the state, the fear that they had simply about being Jewish, that that would cost them their lives and certainly their bodies and dignity almost every single day, is a lesson that I hope we can feel, not just remember, but understand, and how we as a community have stepped forward to protect ourselves in key moments and enlisted others to be our allies. And now as the African-American community in America seeks to do the same thing, I hope that we can see those same currents in history that must move together. We find ourselves in a similar season of uncertainty, of violence, of injustice, another moment asking us all to take action to ensure fair treatment and good long lives for everyone. We have a virus that has struck every community without discrimination, but that discriminates once it hits based on the inequities on health and economic justice and so many other factors in America that we live with unequally. And then a lynching that has shaken all of us, but reinforced the mortal dangers of what it means to be black in America in 2020. But a peaceful and powerful movement has awakened. It's unlike anything I've seen in my lifetime. It's not a moment. It's not yet one more time where people will have an outcry and ask for reforms and little by little it will die off and a little progress will be made. It is demanding us to fundamentally rethink whether we once and for all will look at disparity and do something about it. 
at its core, given the voice of cry of exasperated people saying, I can't breathe. This is a symptom left of a disease left untreated, a structural racism that touches every organ of the body of American life, wounds that have festered and swelled, but they're also a reminder of something else that we as Jews have known for a long time, that when a system of neglect and violence leaves one community at risk, we are all at risk. And we know that our fates are intertwined. We know what it means when people's stories are devalued. We know what happens when some lives are worth less than others. And we know where that story leads. And we've seen clear evidence in our time. We cannot sit idly by and just let this happen. You know, we've seen it in Charleston where a killer ranted against Jews in a manifesto before he went and killed nine African-Americans worshiping in a church. We've seen it in Pittsburgh where a gunman railed against non-white people online and then walked into a shul to murder 11 congregants. And I've seen it in my own life. I'm kind of confusing because I have an Italian last name and I'm half Mexican and half Jewish. I heard the jokes and the jabs when people thought there was no Jew around and no Mexican around. I've been an insider and an outsider, a border crosser all my life. So I know what it means to be the other and I know what it means to have privilege all in one. And the experiences that we each have that forge who we are, that are passed down by the survivors in our families, they must shape a sense of responsibility at this moment. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about, how we lead this battle, both as followers from the outside and as leaders from the inside. We know what it means to stand with a foot in both places, to live with a past of persecution, but a present of privilege. That's the story of my family, my grandfather on my father's side who came to this country in the arms of my bisabuela, my great grandmother, when his father was killed in the Mexican revolution, a war refugee in the hands of a mother who does, did what a mother does, picks up her child and starts walking, who crossed the border with no papers, but just the idea of survival and maybe a glimmer of hope of a better future. That same child earned his citizenship decades later by volunteering to serve this country in World War II, later became a barber and married a meat packer here who was one of 19 children to the same two Mexican-American immigrants originally from Arizona. As I mentioned on the other side, my, grand, my mother's grandparents lived in the Western part of the Russian empire in the face of pogroms, forced conscription, they too set their sights on this land of opportunity. And I am here today as mayor of the second largest city in America because this country kept their promise to them. So many of us have this story and they're summed up in perhaps our most famous piece of art, our Statue of Liberty, where the Jewish poet Emma Lazarus said, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. But this week in America told a different story that generations after Emma Lazarus' words were cast into the Statue of Liberty, that there are too many still yearning to breathe free, but who cannot be free, and in this case, who could not even breathe. If we are not blind, we will see our work. If we are not deaf, we will hear the demands. I've certainly heard in my city and across the country the demands and demonstrations of descendants, not people who came here for a better life, but those who were forced onto a slave ship, who themselves faced a Holocaust on the crossing of the Middle Passage, where so many were killed or left to die, something our community knows something about, who were uplifted from their very homes, their lives, their loves, stripped of their humanity. And that wasn't the end their dignity, their rights, the slave patrols, the original police that was set up in order to enforce their slavery. And then even when there was freedom offered, the black codes, then Jim Crow, blocked by redlining, discriminatory lending, denying basic safety and security until a knee was pushed into their neck. If we can't feel in this moment, we never will. But we must listen to that American story. We must let our tears guide us and our hearts tell us who we are. 
We have to listen to people like the author Tanahasi Coates, who wrote in a letter to his teenage son, the entire narrative of this country argues against the truth of who you are. So let us today confront the truth of who we are. We're mothers who can't send our sons to the store without a lesson in de-escalation. We are fathers who can't send our daughters to college without sharing that some will hate them for being Jewish. We are states still purging black and brown, young and poor people from the voter rolls. We're a nation with so much work to do. But beautifully, you can see that work emerging around us. Because across our union this week, we saw our children reject long held truth to declare that's not who we are. It's not who we choose to be now and certainly not who we choose to be in a generation ahead. So let's hear those voices. Let's take our cues from them. Let us learn as leaders to follow as much as we need to lead. And let's bravely acknowledge injustices, speak the truth, and then take actions that will address us. And let me say one other thing too, let us not find the enemies among us, but find them within us to do the hard work of lifting up and reimagining a country that serves all of its people. This was the work of the ADL long before George Floyd drew his last breath. I used to be the, the head of the National Student Coalition Against Harassment, which dealt with hate crimes and sexual and racial and religious based harassment on college campuses. ADL was one of our key partners. I remember what it was like as a student in New York to go around the country and to talk to people about the seed of hatred and the tools and the practical things that the ADL did to save lives and make no mistake for every life that's lost. I do believe in the generation that's come before we've learned lessons that have saved as many lives as we've lost. We've been able to do things and to make progress, not enough, but you can't save the, sorry, you can't count the lives, lives saved. You can only count the lives lost. And it's important to know what your work has done, whether it's making sure that we look at opportunity, not just as something around policing, but around health and housing, that we raise minimum wages and invest in ending homelessness, that we make sure that, that when there are things on the ballot to fund our schools, that we do that properly because increasingly in our cities, schools have become warehouses for our poorest and usually darkest students in a city. Here in Los Angeles, where we've hired a diverse police force that reflects the population of Los Angeles and trained every officer in what implicit bias is about to help them start a journey and to make sure that their mental health and traumas are addressed, to insist on de-escalation, to adopt the eight can't wait um, measures that can reduce by 72% the number of deaths at the hands of police. And here in Los Angeles, in just four years, that work has reduced fatal police shootings by 45%, nearly cut them in half. And as we look at the crisis that surrounds this of COVID-19, we've seen how it hits communities of color, killing black Americans at twice the rate of white Americans. And here in Los Angeles, we surged testing, we put on an equity lens, and we've cut in half that disparity in our city, and we're gonna keep pushing until there is no disparity. But I wanna say in closing, these moments were called, again, not to just say the right things, but to do brave things, even in the face of criticism, which is why we became the first big city in America to say that we would allocate hundreds of millions of dollars to invest in black communities and to try to do what we can to erase the stains of racism. We said that that would come from all departments, including our police department, because we have to start looking at public safety as not just insisting that our police officers shoulder everything from homelessness to mental health to domestic violence that uh, ails our community and making sure that a, a call to a police officer is not the answer to every social ill that we have. And we need police at the table. We need them to be accountable and held accountable always like every public employee. But we also need a conversation that doesn't decide who somebody is just because they wear a badge or because they have a black face. That is the work that the ADL specializes in. Those are the spaces and the places that we must expand to make sure if we are ever going to get every child to the starting line together, that we understand what it feels to be black in America and even to feel policed upon with the history in our communities and the ongoing legacy of those lives lost. The writer Jelani Cobb calls it the American spring right now. Reverend William Barber calls it the third American reconstruction. My rabbi Sharon Browse calls it the rebirth 
or perhaps the first birth of a true multiracial democracy in America. It is time for us to be those midwives to this rebirth, to reimagine a new reality in our cities and towns, to usher in a country dreamed up by the founders of the ADL that in many ways we have achieved as American Jews, even if we have work still to do, and that now we must insist every American has the opportunity. These are the most difficult days of our lives. Our deepest wounds are being ripped open and our hearts can only grieve every single day. But I choose to not just be grounded in grief and pain, but to embrace the steps forward of hope, of opportunity, the common striving and the common ground we all felt when we watched a man die. As we look to the difficult work ahead, I'm reminded of the words of our Jewish tradition from the story of Esther, when the Megillah reads, perhaps it was for this very moment that you came to your position, for this time that you were placed here. It is for this moment, my friends, this time of uncertainty, this time of rebirth that we are here. A dear friend of mine wrote me a beautiful text yesterday and she said, she's a Christian, she's African-American, but she said, God doesn't ask that we be accomplished. God asks that we be faithful and that we serve. That's what we are called to. Not to say that in the blink of our eyes or the snap of our fingers, everything's gonna be all right, because it's not. But to commit ourselves to realizing that the only holy act is that of service, of each other and of all human beings, so that all of our children can breathe free. Thank you. Love and strength to you all. Wow. Mayor Garcetti, uh, the city of Los Angeles is lucky to have you. And thank you for your faith and thank you for your service. And just thank you for your leadership. It's clear now that we need leaders to lead and what you're doing is so remarkable. We have a lot of questions in the chat. Um, I just want to get us started off by asking you if maybe you could elaborate on the investment you're making in communities of color. It is bold and courageous. I don't think any other mayor has gone so far so fast. Tell us a little bit about that if you could. Sure. And thank you, Jonathan, for, for your words. They're, they're like uh, oxygen right now. Um, so we've committed to at least $250 million, um, which is the biggest reallocation, I think, maybe in our budget's history. Our, our fiscal year starts July 1st, and we have less money than we've ever had, as every city does during COVID-19. Yeah. But we said, if not now, when? And if not, who, mm. if not us, whom? And so we are working with a coalition, a multiracial coalition of grassroots organizations. This work didn't start just from now, but it certainly has accelerated to look at, at peace and healing centers, to see if we can make investments in youth. For instance, one of the things, if this summer we don't have employment for all of our black and brown youth, this is gonna be a long, hot summer. To look at mm -hmm. investing in homelessness, which disproportionately we have 9% of the population uh, in Los Angeles is African-American, but 33% to 40% of the homeless population is African-American. To look at a youth development department, we're standing up a new department of human and civil rights, which people can actually take for the discrimination they face in a workplace or someplace else to a judicial body and get financial compensation for the racism that they face. We've put together 16 initiatives for our police department building on many that we've put in the country that resulted, as I said, in cutting our fatal shootings in half. Everything from insisting on independent prosecution where there are police shootings because prosecutors and police work so closely together to making sure that we have investments in the mental health of our officers, um, implicit bias training, not just once in their career, but each year to really get down to what might rest in their hearts so that they can be aware of it and change that. Um, and then we also are going to make, I think, a huge investment as well in looking at what we can do around health in the African-American communities of Los Angeles. I think that the, people don't recognize, if you grow up in Watts, a predominantly black area of Los Angeles, you have life expectancy 12 years less than in Bel Air. So that is your life sentence, is you can do everything perfectly and still live 12 years less. And so we're gonna count and measure and show that we're going to then invest in the places where we have to change those metrics. And then we're going to lastly look at what can we, I don't think defunding police departments is maybe the right phrase. What can we unpolice 
When we ask a police officer to go solve homelessness, she or he is not the best trained person to do that. So what if we move mm. some resources from what we expect police officers to do and put them in folks who are the social workers who can help get somebody off the street, the mental health workers who can de-escalate a situation as well as so many of our police can and do. We've done a lot of that in Los Angeles. They're still not experts in that. And that can help make sure our 911 calls are, are still answered on time. The interventions where we do need a police, they're there available and uplifted but we don't put so much on their shoulders that results in so much tragedy for us all, including them. I, I, it's really very helpful. I mean, I think the idea of unpolicing is so smart. We know the system is set up to be adversarial. The system is set up to be prosecutorial rather than sort of rehabilitative, right? And facilitative. So I, I think that's a bold and smart move. We're getting questions in the chat coming back to the issue of COVID. You know, we've talked to people about the fact that one of the things we're employing our people to do who want to make a difference, show up and vote. How is COVID-19, though, in a city as far flung, as, as diverse, where things like, you know, public transportation can be a challenge? How is, will the COVID-19 uh, crisis impact voting in November? I'm worried about it, quite frankly. We see moves to suppress votes. And I don't quite get it because I'll, I'll get partisan for a second. You know, Republicans yeah. are fighting against voting by mail where they usually do better, insisting that people turn out as they did in Wisconsin, where then the Republicans lost. It's kind of a strange thing. I would think that we as Americans would just say everybody deserves to vote. It's a cornerstone of our democracy. If you lose, you lose. That's part of a democracy. Don't change rules. Don't make it tough. And I'm worried that folks won't um, know how to vote by mail and that the margins are enough to change elections. If you are able to depress that by five or 10%, that's enough to change the outcomes. So we're doing a lot, especially for instance, with our census workers to help them transition into educating people about their other responsibilities, including voting. And I do hope that all states, we're gonna do it in California, where we can send out vote by mail to everybody that they can feel safe. And maybe by then too, people will feel uh, safe enough as we've lined up to go into Starbucks, we can certainly wait in line, I think, to go into vote. And that will be an absolutely critical part of this fall. That is the biggest change we can make in America. I love it. I love it. So I think we share a friend in Sharon Browse, who's just thoughtfulness and, uh, you know, compassion. I really admire. You have so many great leaders in the city of LA, but I want to just close with the last question about your Jewish faith. And so you talked about, I think a few times, even in the course of your remarks, you know, referencing the book of Esther and reminding us, if not now, when. So as you, as you look forward, how do you think we can learn from our Jewish faith, those of us who are Jewish, as we try to navigate these really mm. difficult and almost unprecedented times? You know, right now in our shuls, we're uh, in the book of Numbers, which is probably the right place for us to be, to be in the desert. Uh -huh. um, it was always my central question as a Jew, why did it take us you know, 40 years to get through an eight week walk. Um, what was it that God wanted to, us to learn? And why is it in that book, by the way, that the middle can be so painful that the book is mostly about the first and the last year? Uh, mm -hmm. How is it that we in the desert uh, hungered for Egypt where we were slaves, that we missed the watermelon, that we missed the leeks and we missed the onions and we didn't just want to keep eating manna every single day but I think the lessons are that time in the desert, God, God waited till we were ready and America's waiting till we're ready. I, I pray, you know, it was every day at the beginning of COVID-19, um, my wife set up a little prayer circle with Rabbi Rouse and Rabbi Leader, a member also at Wilshire Boulevard Temple here, and a number of pastors and a, a Muslim religious leader who's a dear friend. And we just pray very privately with each other. But I'll tell you, it's gotten me through every single day. And those lessons that we think this pain is the first pain human beings have heard. This is the first time people have been enslaved. This is the first time people have died at the hands of the state and asked for the world to change. In many ways, that's what we chronicle in our history. There's probably all the beautiful times in between, but when people say, oh my gosh, all we do is suffer, it's because those are the right. moments that were the most important. And that's where we grew. And I think that's where we find our humanity. And I pray that that will be what we find in this moment of pain to find that humanity and to write our chapter in that history of our book. Well, Mayor Garcetti, it is generous of you to spend the time with us today when you have so much going on. I wanna really just say thank you for, I guess what I would call prophetic leadership, 
I mean, I think it's not many mayors who can as effort as effortlessly as you move between whatever the Parsha is this week and thinking about again how we're going to deploy public, you know, municipal funds. Uh, and I think again, uh, the great city of Los Angeles, one of the greatest cities in the world, is really richer and better for your leadership. And I'll say one thing as we close, Mayor Garcetti, you know ADL. I will commit to you here and now. Our our education resources, our training resources. We run programs and we will work with you any way that you need to make these healing centers and the broader work of repairing Los Angeles as successful as possible. You have my full support and commitment. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you and the entire ADL and bless everybody on this call. Strength. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Garcetti. Bye. Take care.